The August 30th primary is just a month away now, and most Duval County School Board races will be decided at that point. Today, our election coverage continues. We welcome Becky Nathanson, candidate for School Board District 3. Welcome, Becky. Thank you. So glad to be here. I'm so glad to have you. So there are so many issues to grapple with on the school board. There is money, there's safety, there's the long-term viability of public schools, um, and then also what some might call social and cultural issues. Which of those is most important to you? I'm running for three three big reasons. I think it's hard to rank which are the most important, but um, the literacy rate in Duval County has got to be addressed. So I'm most concerned with academic achievement and setting our children who attend public school on a path to prosperity. Right now, about half of the students at every grade level in Duval County are not reading at grade level proficiency. Um, so we've got to be laser focused on that. Um, of course, I think, I think the top three priorities are all interconnected. So my other two would be financial management and fiscal responsibility. The, the school district has $2.7 billion, larger than the city budget. Um, we have money when I'm knocking doors, talking to taxpayers. Um, they voted for tax increases and they're asking, um, where's the return on the investment? So where's the money going? Um, can't, why can't we be focused on providing what the teachers need to get the instruction delivered so that our students are reading at grade level? And then the third priority is the climate and culture in our schools and accountability related to um, student behavior and even teacher behavior. And we want to know that we're sending our children into safe, secure environments where learning is the focus. And when I talk to teachers, they would like to see that they're supported in that regard and they can focus on instruction if the administration, if the school district backs them up in handling um, safety and discipline issues. I know that one point that you've raised is how Duval County spends its money compared to other large urban school districts mm -hmm. in the state. And looking at the fact that Duval County seems to spend a great deal more on things like transportation and mm -hmm. food service versus instruction. Um, and that does seem to be a, an issue that you're looking to get mm -hmm. some answers to. I mean, obviously, we're a big county, so yes. transportation, I, you can kind of see right. that being right. a cost. Um, but in terms of student funding, you know, Florida does lag. It's nine some thousand dollars per pupil funding um, behind places like Alabama and Louisiana. Um, do you see any problem with the fact that Florida's per pupil funding is so much lower than much of the country? I think the larger concern is what we're doing with the dollars. Um, the the fund, it's not a funding issue. It's an allocation issue. Um, and I'm, I think Florida has been a leader in the funding following students. So as we attract and retain teachers and as we attract and retain students in the system, there will be more funding following those students and going into our schools. Got a call from Debbie in, the, in Mandarin. Good morning, Debbie. Go ahead. Hi, good morning. Um, every month, IBEW representative Frank DeLong speaks at monthly meetings, speaks at the monthly school board meetings. And every month, Frank brings multiple examples of wasteful spending and subpar work by contractors that cost the district in unnecessary additional money. How can you rein in abusive contract costs and remedy per subpar contractor costs? One example of out of control spending is $36,000 on Minecraft lighting for one classroom at one school. Good question, Debbie. Your thoughts? Yeah, I, I have some thoughts about that. Thank you for the call. Um, I don't know if it's always an issue uh, of whether a service is contracted out or whether it's in-house. It's a matter of managing um, managing and holding people accountable to the deliverables that they are responsible for delivering. So as a school board member, if I'm, if I'm asked to vote on a contract, those above $75,000, um, I would vet that. I would review it carefully and not just rubber stamp everything that comes before the board. Um, but I do think we can do better with accountability and making sure that our dollars are being spent wisely, whether they're contracted out or whether we're paying our own staff to do those things. We have a call from Melissa in San Marco. Good morning, Melissa. Go ahead. Good morning. Um, I saw a flyer from your campaign, uh, Becky, with endorsements from a list of elected officials and pastors. And I'm just wondering why they're all supporting you and not your opponent. 
Well, um, I can tell you that after four years, my incumbent has been in office and the voters of District 3, the conservative voters of District 3 who put her in office have watched her govern. And all I can say is that I'm willing to stand up, um, vote my conscience and stand for the values that I believe in. And a great number, a growing list of individuals and groups continue to endorse me. And I'm grateful for that. We should say your endorsements include the Fraternal Order of Police, the governor. Governor DeSantis. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to just mention your opponent was on the program. We'll have a link to her interview if people want to check that out. That will be on the First Coast Connect website with this story. We have a call from Yasmina in Arlington. Good morning, Yasmina. Go ahead. Hi, good morning. This is in regard to a tweet on July 1st, 2023. You gloated about being a proud member of Moms for Liberty, and I quote how you and your group are beautiful and joyful domestic terrorists. How does this mentality undermine the very people in this country that you will be elected to serve? Thanks, Yasmina. Becky, you are uh, one of the founding members, I believe, of the Duval chapter of Moms for Liberty. I'm proud of standing up for parental rights. I, I have I'm not clear on what tweet she's referring to. I'm not a domestic terrorist. I can tell you that parents across the nation, including here in Duval County, when we got involved and started speaking up on behalf of parental rights, when we started reviewing school board policy and packets, we've been called extremists, radicals, domestic terrorists. Um, We're nothing of the sort, but I can't address a tweet that I'm not looking at. Moms for Liberty has been designated an extremist group by the Southern Poverty Law Center. Do you think that that is... um... The Southern Poverty Law Center basically identifies any group more conservative than they are as extreme or as a hate group. They've been discredited. They've had to lay off over 60 employees. I don't need to respond to the Southern Poverty Law Center. They, I think a, a large part of their concern is language about LGBTQ community and a lot of language that tends to label people that you know support or advocate for that community as groomers. Just kind of- I have never done that. Mm-hmm. My chapter has never done that. So I'm not going to respond to something that's a false allegation. I, that, I don't think that's a false allegation. I have never referred to teachers no, no. as groomers. But Mothers for Liberty certainly has. Moms I, for Liberty? Sorry. Moms no, for Liberty. no, they haven't. I, uh, Moms for Liberty is a big interest on the show. I've heard it brought up in lots of shows. I'd encourage you to have them on and they'd be happy to talk about their positions on things. I'm a candidate for school board, so I'd rather talk about my campaign. Yeah, we we are talking to Moms for Liberty and hoping to have them on sometime soon. So Good. that Good. should happen. Um, we've got a call from Kathy in Mandarin. Good morning, Kathy. Go ahead. Kathy, you want to turn down your radio and go ahead, Kathy? I'm going to put you on hold, Kathy. Uh, I've got a call from Brent in Mandarin. Good morning, Brent. Go ahead. Yes, uh, my student, my my child was a student of Becky's, and she was a really great teacher. My my. My child was very happy when she saw her picture on her those big signs. But anyway, uh, I would like to know what you want to do to retain good teachers because they seem to be leaving. Well, actually, right now they're getting fired. What is your plan to retain those students? I mean, those uh, teachers. Thanks, Brent. Thank you. And just to be clear, I'm, I haven't been a teacher, but I have been a substitute teacher. So perhaps that caller is referring to that. Um I think we can retain teachers by offering them the support they need. I've done focus groups with teachers. Um, They feel um, oftentimes that the district purchases new products and programs and is continually trying new things. We need to stick with what works, especially when it comes to literacy, the science of reading approach. Um, But we need to listen to the teachers on the front line and consider their perspectives when the school board's passing policy. But again, I think focusing on the culture and the climate and answering, um, addressing the concerns that they've indicated in the safety survey, for example, that the Duval Teachers Union recently did. They surveyed 800 uh, teachers to ask about safety and security, and I think their responses need to be taken seriously, and we need to address those. One of the things that you have on kind of your resume is work on developing curriculum. Mm -hmm. What kind of curriculum do you develop? Yeah, a workforce development curriculum, so not in academia. Okay. But I have worked in a variety of industries in the human resources profession. And so I've been um, responsible for developing curriculum, both to develop leadership and supervisory skills at um, higher levels in organizations. But I've also been a part of developing um, basic frontline 
workforce skills, um, oftentimes that are lacking from high school graduates that um, employers would have thought they would have mastered or received in high school. So we've had to do some of that type of remedial education and training in the workforce, but I've done a little bit of all of that and everything in between. Among the choices and decisions that will be made by the next school board has to do with, you know, budget issues and the possibility of school closures and consolidations. And there are, I think, at least four potential school closures or that are on that district, on that list of, you know, mm-hmm. possible um, mm-hmm. closures that are in District 3, all of them elementary schools. What is your feeling about that plan overall as a cost saving measure for the yeah. district? Do you support consolidating or possibly closing some of these schools? Well, I think some of the consolidations have to happen. That was a part of the very original master facilities plan um, from years ago. There's just an acknowledgement that we have some schools in certain sections of town with not enough students in them to, to pay for the operation of that school, meaning general fund dollar. The funding is supposed to follow the students. So we've got money um, that should be funding schools that have a high number of students going to operate schools that may not have enough students um, in them. Now, the current plan is getting worked through, and it requires a lot of community input. Um, it's my understanding that the district and the school board are listening carefully to all the stakeholders as they should um, as they should be doing. But uh, I, I hope I answered your question. I think so. Okay. Um, I want to ask you about that money following mm-hmm. students because that is one of the big discussions in the state right now. Mm-hmm. The reality that, you know, between vouchers and charter schools, that a lot of money that traditionally went to traditional public education is going elsewhere, mm-hmm. which is why there is this budget yeah. crisis. Well, uh, the, the money's going elsewhere because the students are going elsewhere. So um, voters overwhelmingly support school choice and the funding following students, not systems. Um, I would like to see our public school system improve in every way that we can so that it is an excellent choice for everyone who has a school nearby that's a neighborhood DCPS school. That would be great. Um, and we can get that funding back if we can re- attract and re- retain those families and those students. But fundamentally, you support the idea of dollars following students, for instance, if they want to go to a private school. Well, that's the law. Right. But I mean, is that something that you believe is yes, an appropriate because, law? Yes, because if the public school can compete, we can win those students back. Mm-hmm. I'm going to take a call from Karen in Jacksonville. Good morning, Karen. Go ahead. Oh, hi. Um, good morning. Um, my question would be to just elaborate a little more on your work experience and your human resource experience and the fact that you worked at NASA and you worked at University Hospital and you have so much more experience than um, I can't even find any experience on your um, on your opponent. Tell us more. Sounds like a supporter. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, I have not worked for NASA, um, but I can I can explain. I have I currently have a business that is a very small one man show. Um, human resources, consulting, instructional design, leadership development, um, workshop facilitation. And I was I was uh, recruited to work for another company that had a contract with NASA. So I have gone down to um, the Cape and delivered some management and leadership workshops there. So I think that's what she's talking about. But um, really, I think what has been a part of my experience that I think will be a very valued skill set and perspective on the school board is that I worked in a very contentious union environment, um, and I helped work with managers and collective bargaining units um, to to hold employees accountable um, and to follow the rights of all workers and comply with collective bargaining agreements and look at policy and all those things. So I bring that perspective to the board that I think is currently lacking. A couple of topics I think we always have to touch on. Um you know, the issue of book removals from classrooms or from libraries, um, the issue of teaching around the issue of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Mm -hmm. So the book removals, what's your question about it? Do you support them? If it's inappropriate, um, if it's sexually explicit, I mean, that's, that's the law. So, um, how about books that are recognized classics or Pulitzer Prize? I don't think they should be removed, period. I never have advocated for that. So books like Beloved or The Bluest Eye? No, I, haven't, I have not challenged any book like that. Okay. Um, the, the other, what was the other question? Uh, DEI. What's your question about it? Um, I don't think that should be the focus. I think we should 
be focused on the basics in public education. We need to have a, a merit-based system that focuses on literacy for every single employee, literacy, math, civics education. Mm -hmm. So for, and I guess the question for DEI is, you know, one of the questions, the law requiring now that, you know, if lessons make someone uncomfortable in a classroom that they shouldn't be taught. Mm -hmm. And I think people who support DEI education would say some of the things that need to be taught do make people uncomfortable, including things like the history of slavery. I don't think the history of slavery should not be taught. I think we need to teach the good, the bad, the ugly, all of it. Teach the Holocaust, teach slavery, teach everything warts and all about American history. Because... Even if it makes someone feel bad. Yes. Okay, good. We've got a question from Jerry in Arlington. Go ahead, Jerry. Uh, yes, um, Miss Becky, um, I live in Arlington and I heard you at one of the forums and uh, you talked about um, contracts and policies that uh, the school board, you know, has to review. And I want to know what value do you bring and what experience do you bring to the school board to review those kind of things? Because we know that our tax dollars have not always been spent wisely on the school board. So can you explain what you can bring to the table to, Thanks, to make Jerry. that better? Well, I think we may have already addressed that. Thank you there for the call. Um, I just want to bring a serious effort to provide oversight and scrutiny um, to ask questions in school board workshops and school board meetings to really do my best to vet and review anything that I'm being asked to vote on. And I think, you know, we could do better just by shining a light, increasing transparency on these issues, I think will drive higher performance. Um, just briefly to touch on one of the issues that you've spoken to the school board about before was the health survey that used mm -hmm. to be done of mm -hmm. students. You objected because it included some questions about sexual activity. Mm -hmm. Um, but now there is no survey. What do you want to try to get a health survey back? It was information used by a lot of agencies, you know, whether they're suicide prevention or drug prevention. Mm -hmm. I would be open to that. And I think that I think that the Department of Education was going to offer an alternative. I'm not sure about that particularly, but I feel like I have a memory of that. I don't mind surveys being done, but if they're asking students um, questions about their sexual history, being sexually abused or raped, parents need to be have that information before it's being asked of their children. And what if kids aren't comfortable telling their parents? Is we, it is it not important for schools and other agencies to know if kids are having We do not activity? need to be asking 10, 11, and 12-year-olds if they started having sex at age 8, 9, or 10. And those were questions in the survey. So no, parents do not want their children being asked those questions. I mean, it's probably worth saying that 5% of kids before the age of 11 are sexually active. I don't agree with those questions being asked without parents' knowledge and consent. All right. We're going to have to wrap it. Thank you so much for being here, Becky Nathanson. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you. I appreciate it.